I'm making up for lost time, but not in this lifetime. I was told that I'm supposed to fight rhymes. My ancestors were superheroes. I'm supposed to fight crime, but not the ones up in the streets, the ones that's lurking in your mind. Real Talk with Star Scorpio, season five, episode 10. Yes, I have my guest, Osa the Healer. Bro, when I heard your music, I was impressed. Big up Ock Nation for playing it that night because I was like, okay, what is this? You know, I'm an old head. So I was like, what kind of music am I going to hear? This hip hop rap. I was so impressed with your music. I said, I have to reach out to this young man and have him on my show. So Man. Osa, yes, yeah, Osa, the, to be here. yes, yeah. welcome to Real me. Talk. Yeah, yeah, shout out, shout out to you, Star, for having me. Yeah, shout out Ock Nation, too. <laughs> yeah, shout out the whole nation. <laughs> yes. Yeah, interesting place to find me, right? Trust me, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Osa, let me know first. We like to build a timeline here on Real Talk. So let me know, where were you born and raised? Oh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So let me see how I'm going to answer that. So I was conceived in Nigeria. My parents are from Nigeria. I, I was conceived there, but when I was actually born, I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and then immediately went back to Nigeria, spent the first maybe uh, five years of my life there. And then I came back uh, to Silver Spring, Maryland, which is right outside DC. And I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland. Oh, wow. I was going to ask you about your lineage. So yeah. Nigerian. Okay. Yeah. And, um, so you have, you have you have siblings then? How many siblings you have? Yeah, yeah. I got two siblings, two sisters, younger sisters. Two younger sisters, man. Yeah. And you know, real talk, I age people on here, man. So I'm 49. How old are you, man? Oh, I'm 38. 38. Okay. And um, because I want to see the eras. I'm gonna mention something in a minute. But um, where do you reside now, man? I live in Washington, DC. So you're still in DC. Yeah, in the nation's capital. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know what I noticed though, right? I live in Canada, as you know, and some sometimes people I know move around. I'm in Toronto, but we don't really venture out to the other provinces. Some people do for work and things or school, Calgary, BC, even yeah. Montreal. Yeah. But I notice some people in the States, you, you move around different parts of the States a lot. Are you one of those people or did you mainly reside in dc yeah i've mostly been in what's called the dmv area um mm -hmm. i've i've haven't lived outside i mean i've lived in baltimore that's but that's in maryland um yeah. i lived in orlando florida for a little bit um but mostly yeah i've been in like this dmv around the beltway area okay okay yeah. and um school man how were your school years and i'm particularly talking about high school now uh um, where'd you where'd you go to high school did you go to high school and um how was your experience um yeah. in high school yeah high school was great actually i just had my uh 20 year reunion actually uh in october was it 20 how old am i, I don't know 2002 <laughs> yeah yeah 22 yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. my 20 year reunion um uh, in october it was really great um awesome years high school for me was good i feel like that's when like i woke up you know okay. and like i I don't know. I felt like there's something happened to me one day. I woke up like I was an average kid, you know what I'm saying? Growing up middle school, nothing spectacular. But then I don't know, like ninth grade, something clicked in me and I started to really appreciate what I could do with myself mm -hmm. intellectually, like writing. I got really strong in writing. I got really strong in math um, mm -hmm. and in language. So um, I did well in, in a lot of those classes, at least my first couple years of high school. And then, you know, yeah, I started being a knucklehead. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so tell me something. I'm glad you touched on that because I always ask my guests how they were in the math, the English, and the sciences. And it seems like you're saying the English and the math you excelled in. Yeah. Besides that, was there anything extracurricular? And when I'm saying that, I mean like the arts or the sports that you dabbled in. Because I have a feeling that I heard you say you played ball. I don't know if you played ball. Yeah. Like, how tall are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm six foot three. You're six so, three. You're up yeah, there. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah. So I was. Um, I played basketball. Uh, yeah, I played on the varsity basketball team my senior year and like maybe summer leagues and stuff like. But on the street, yeah, I was always playing basketball every day. I was. That's all I used to do is mm -hmm. play basketball and then rap. I got into uh, got into rap, of course, in high school. Um, and actually, it was actually really 
through my English class mm-hmm. that rap really came into um, my being. I remember um, we had an assignment. It was like to write some poems or something like that. Yeah. And for extra credit, uh, the teacher was like, you could you could share it in the class. Yeah. So I went up there and I shared some poems, some rinky dink poem I made okay. about not wanting to do homework. Mm-hmm. But I realized in that moment how powerful that was because I'm like, yo, I'm sitting up here and I can say whatever I want mm-hmm. and everybody's going to listen for a finite amount of time. And I realized how much power that was in a good way, in a positive way. And I said, even though it's nerve wracking, yeah. like I want to do more with this. So I started writing more. I started writing. Then I started rapping, started mm-hmm. rapping, 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 rapping. And and just from there, just kind of catapulted. I was in freestyle cyphers at all the lunch tables, beating on desks. I don't know if y'all did that. We used to like make beats yeah. on desks and start cypher. I was at all the cyphers in high school. Anybody remember me from high school? I was at all the cyphers. And um, it just kind of went from there. That's what I want to know, bro. This is what I want to know. So a lot of the the rappers around the way, in Toronto that I know in school, they would have the freestyle battles sometimes during class Mm -hmm. or after school Mm -hmm. around the lockers outside, whatever. That's when people would battle. So you did the freestyle thing you're saying, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. I loved it. I love to do it. I mean, I wasn't like a battle. I mean, I had some battles, but I wasn't like so much to battle. I was just like, I would kick it in a cypher. Mm-hmm. just drop some rhymes or whatever um i wasn't i didn't really like to use my words to like to attack people to try and hurt people i just never really wanted to do that i could yeah i'd probably be very good at it but, <laughs> you know I mean? yeah yeah but i was kind of like now nah, like tearing people down i never really liked doing that yeah but we so, would battle in a sense of like showing off skill and displaying skill that type of battle all, all day so do you feel that um from your your reading ability and the things that you read and you're 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 versed with certain knowledge and words did that help you then when it oh, yeah. came to the freestyles and the rapping and writing absolutely i remember um yeah in ninth grade i got in trouble my my father grounded me for like three months mm-hmm. and i had seen the malcolm x movie and so when i was grounded for three months i started reading the dictionary and bam i just started learning all these words Boom, just l- learning different words, three syllable, four syllable words. And and then I was able to like start, then I started putting them into my raps. And yeah. it, it just really made it just a lot more effect. Now I don't really rap with a lot of big words like that. I don't really yeah. like that because if you're going over, if it goes over my head when I hear other rappers do it, so I'm yeah. like, oh, really. <laughs> of course. But, but it helped actually, um, yeah, with my, my writing ability, it became mm-hmm. way much stronger. You know, I could write essays like nobody's business. And so it helped me in school a lot, just having the, the access to words and just and just even in in just in different circles because mm-hmm. I went to my, my high school was really diverse my neighborhood wasn't it was like a lot of blacks Hispanics and Im- immigrants okay. so it was just that but I had classes with the Asian kids I had classes with the with the white kids I had classes with kind of everybody and so I moved around in different groups outside of my immediate neighborhood yeah. so being able to like keep up in conversations and things like that was really helpful. Yeah. Although, you know, when you're a young black man, nobody ever asked you what's your favorite book to read. So yeah. I, I, it was kind of weird. Everyone always asked me, yo, were you playing basketball, basketball. or sports? And, uh, and which I did, but it was kind of like, it was weird because nobody ever asked me like, what was my favorite book? Not that I had one, but yeah. You know I mean? Yeah, I get it. I get it. Really nice. Yo, so in Toronto, we were lucky enough because a lot of our parents came from the Caribbean. Yeah. So I'm half Bayesian, half Guyanese, yeah. South America. But I know a lot of the Jamaicans, a lot of the Trinis. Um, and then we grew up with a lot of Greeks, Italian, Pakistani, Indian. Mm-hmm. We were, It was yeah. a mix. So well diverse in culture and everything. Right. I don't know if I had misconception about the States because besides white, I thought it was like back in the days, blacks and hispanics but how was it growing up to you with the culture and i want to just touch on that too before we get into the music yeah um when it comes to like the violence you know mm-hmm. when i was young in the 90s i went to brooklyn a lot i got a lot of relatives okay. in brooklyn okay one of my friends scared me so much about new york i was afraid to go to brooklyn and then when i get there i'm like 
what's to be afraid of, right? Yeah. And I know there's areas and things like that. And it was even it was ninety, it was ninety two, I think, when I went. Oh wow! Yeah. But let me know, like, as a Toronto kid, I didn't know what it was like for someone, a black man, growing up. Let me know from your sp- perspective. Yes, you know, so it's interesting. Yeah, because I grew up in a very diverse area. Like my area, the wider area, like my city was very diverse. My high school, we had people represented from over 90 nations, right? So much so they put up a hall of nations with all the flags that were represented. It was over 90 flags, right? Mm -hmm. So I got to I got to see different cultures around everybody. However, my neighborhood, it was just blacks, you know, means Hispanics, a sprinkle of a couple white kids. And so you had a lot of the issues that you have almost anywhere where there's a concentration of black people. So my neighborhood, it was the most violent. It was the most drug ridden. It it had the most police activity. Mm -hmm. And so when I was young, when I was 13, you know, 14, 15, whatever, I always saw it as like, yo, cops are always harassing us and like profiling us and things like that. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm older, I'm kind of like, well, yeah, we were bad <laughs> as shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Excuse my language. Yeah. But yeah, because like when I was young, even though I wasn't, the, I promise you, I wasn't no thug or nothing like that. However, yeah. most of the dudes, older dudes in my neighborhood was about that life. So it's like, and even me, I was a little, I was a knucklehead, right? So it's yeah. like, even when I was getting harassed by cops, the majority of the times it was like, I usually was on the way to do something illegal, had mm-hmm. just finished doing something illegal, mm-hmm. or was in the middle of doing something illegal, right? Yeah. So were they really terrorizing me? It's like, I don't know anymore, you know? And it's so it was so prevalent that, like, where I grew up, mm-hmm. they went and just, they put a whole police station in the neighborhood. Oh. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, it's it was that much activity. Mm-hmm. So it felt... It felt a little weird, you know, and 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 there was a local newspaper called the Gazette. They would write about the crime in our neighborhood, but I was impervious to it because yeah. the old the older dudes around me, they would let us be kids. You right. know what I'm saying? Like we I just played basketball and you know what I mean? And like I the dudes who were doing the terrorizing, they was my buddies. So I I didn't know how much terror they were really inflicting i just they just do what they do you know what i mean right. um but and i thought that some of the stuff was normal i thought that like that's just how people grew up i thought wow. that you just had neighborhoods like that and people just like we didn't have gangs mm-hmm. we just it was just people from around the way yeah and they just they did what they did but they were notorious notorious other neighborhoods i remember in school when when sometimes when people found out what neighborhood i lived in mm-hmm. they would hesitate to invite me to their house parties because they knew if people from my neighborhood came to their house party it was a fight it, oh wow yeah. yes so i mean it was it was good because i got to see kind of both sides yeah you know, i got to see what it's like inside of this uh community the community yeah and <laughs> and then like kind of like other communities and things like that so i got to see some of those contrasts so I feel like I got a well-rounded kind of background and upbringing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yo, I'm going to touch on, when we get into the music, I have something to ask about um, one of your tracks that I listened to that has to do with this. All right. And this is a leading question to it. Like, so how was your parents growing up? Your father, did you have a strict, um, did you have strict yeah. parents? Oh yeah. I got Nigerian parents. Yeah. I got Nigerian <laughs> parents, man. I got Nigerian father. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. All the, all the, all the stereotypical things, not all of them, but a lot of them, you know what I mean? Um, they were actually probably a little bit more lax than the average Nigerian parent, but still a lot of the same. I had really high expectations. My father really wanted me to do well. He really didn't accept mediocrity, which, which became very contentious in the household because everywhere else in the entire country, mediocrity was okay right me being average was okay Mm -hmm. and but with my father it it never was so it was just it was really difficult we butt heads a lot especially in my teenage years but it it was just me it wasn't him he was Mm -hmm. great I had good parents my mother my mother good mom you know I'm saying father's a good father good great man Mm -hmm. and uh it was just me I was just a little buckethead and little knucklehead you know and I didn't I didn't really appreciate it at the time but Thank God I had him in my life, man. I'm so grateful, you know what I mean? Just that he was there, even though I, I didn't listen a lot. But mm-hmm. as I got older, it humbled me, I, you know, and our relationship has gotten a whole lot better. So retrospectively, looking back on it, you see 
the light that your father brought to you, right? Man, yeah. and, and, I mean, it's so invaluable, you know, as I grew up and I have friends and who didn't have the same experience and like how, you know, their, their um, principles and values differed and, you know, just the pain of not having their father around. I mean, even some of the toughest dudes, yeah. it just, it's still painful, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So I'm glad I, that I didn't have to go through that. Wow, man. Um, are you taller than your dad now? Because um, there was a there was a um, a basketball a dunker professional dunker I interviewed Chris Staples and I asked mm -hmm. my last guest I forgot who it was now, but um, I asked him if they were a late bloomer because you say you're six three oh it was Wrench Turner DJ, yeah. uh, were you a late bloomer because um some people shot up like grade nine and then in high school they're like six one six two, were you a late bloomer or were you tall? all through junior high high school yeah i was like pretty tall usually um i think after eighth grade eighth grade i definitely or the summer after eighth grade i definitely hit a hit a growth spurt of like two three inches so i probably mm -hmm. went from like five ten to like six one or six two between yeah. eighth and ninth grade year and then um yeah and then so i'm like six three my dad is i he's always six five i believe he might be getting a little shorter yeah, he says I'm six five. I don't think I'm six five. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's getting a little. Me, he might be losing some inches, man. <laughs> oh, but he was still taller than you. Eh? He still. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. wow. Mm. Yeah. All right. So we messaged each other. You said something to be interesting. Um, I was talking about it earlier. Uh, you said you're kind of hybrid in between. So when it comes to the music, what era did you grow up in? Because when I get into your music. It's my type of music. I'm a beat guy and I'm a I'm a lyric guy too, but beats are first. But um you said you're a hybrid. So what music did you grow up with um when you first started listening to rap? Say. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't really get into rap until maybe like the mid nineties era. Mid nineties. Um okay. so you know, that's like that's like um, the Lost Boys, a lot of East Coast, a lot of East Coast. Um, I like I like Jay. I was really into um, Nas, um, that kind of era, the Fugees, mm -hmm. um, though that type, the Queen Latifah. I got some Queen Latifah in there. Um, yeah. You know what I'm saying? The Tribe Called Quest. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. kind of like kind of like a, a, a mixed hybrid mm -hmm. because I really got in. It was like the mid mid '90s, mid to late '90s. Okay, and. Did you mimic your style after a rapper, like some of the rappers say they do, and then they, you know, transform into their own style? Or did you always have your like own style right off the hop? Nah, I I don't I can't say that I did. Um I I used to write lyrics down. Like I used to write like Eminem's lyrics down. Um, maybe some Snoop Dogg. I would write them down, but I, when I started writing, I, it was kind of more of my own. But I would say, like, my biggest influence, though, was probably um, Tyler Kweli mm -hmm. on, on that Reflection Eternal album. I mean, I, I used to listen, I would listen to a lot of rap before that, right? Because I was like, what, 99, 2000? But, um, but when that album hit, it was this one song he had called Africa Dream. Yeah. And uh, High Tech, the the joint he produced, like the way he produced that is the beat, right? And then yeah. just the lyrics quietly spit on it. I remember after he, after finish, finishing that song, the first time I said, nah, I'm a rap. Mm -hmm. Like I was like, nah, I'm, I'm gonna do this <laughs> rap thing. Because that was, that was a different kind of rap. Because I couldn't, the rap that I used to listen to, I couldn't do because I didn't live that life. Like I wasn't yeah. a gangster. Like I wasn't, I loved the locks, but it's like, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a gangster. Like I'm not a tough guy like that. I loved, DMX, I love DMX. Like I can I can do a whole dissertation on DMX. Mm -hmm. Um guys like that, but it was like, you know, Lil Wayne, Cash Money, oh yeah, Hot Boys, like I loved them, but it's like none of that stuff was really me. But then when I heard Kwali and you know, I mean, you know, like Black Thought too from the Roots. I used to love I love the Roots a lot too. Mm -hmm. Um, but like when I heard that the African dreams when I was like, nah, I I, I can do this. Yeah. You know You're talking I mean? about Black Star, right? Black Star most yeah, deaf, yeah, Twilight. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah, them, them too, Black Star. Yeah. So, man, I'm telling you, when I grew up with, like, lyricists, like the Big Daddy Kane, right? Uh, yeah, I heard that. I felt that coming. <laughs> Big Daddy Kane, <laughs> I felt that coming. Yeah. So there's one thing, though. 
I like the Big Daddy Kane. There's so many rappers. I'm I'm losing my memory now, man. So I, I could drop names and things, but I can't remember. But you know, more the lines of the Biggie and the Kane, yeah, and even Meth and Red. I love oh, yeah. lyrics, but when I heard people like Common, right? It, yes, and then Mota, I know what you're talking about. I was like, whoa, yeah. this is, and this is what I feel your style is too, man. It's yeah, especially it's, Common. I mean, Common is 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 big. Actually, I was a huge common fan um like water for chocolate one day it'll all make sense a penny for your thoughts like really really introspective like mm -hmm. introspective kind of rap music that's uh you know just digging deeper in into like some of these daily things that we we think about mm -hmm. so yeah 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 definitely common was a huge influence as well yeah trust and you know what you answered my question i was gonna ask you if your style changed because I know some rappers start off with a certain style and then some of them um, start changing the way. So it might be like hard hitting and then they go conscious. But it seems like you knew your lane from the beginning. Yeah, pretty early on. I mean, I was a little bit, obviously when I was younger, I was a little bit more hard hitting. I used to cuss a whole lot in my yeah. rap, even though it was still thoughtful, but I used to cuss a whole lot. But I remember actually going back to my father, right? Yeah. I remember uh, in high school, <laughs> My father found one of my rap books. Oh my god! Oh, it was terrible, man. He 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 opened up the book. I remember he read the line to me because I never gonna forget this. He read me one of the lines, and he was like, "Because I said something like it started off like scrambling ass niggas always fucking up my reception," and I thought that was a bar. I was like, Yo, "Scramble reception," and you know what I mean. I thought that was a bar. He was like, "Man, what is this?" That he made me shred my whole rap book. I don't know why my dad had a, a paper shredder in the crib. Yeah, he had a paper shredder. He made me shred the whole thing. When I start, when I tell you, I cried like a baby. Wow, I cried like a baby. Mm -hmm. However, that was the most powerful thing that ever happened for my rap skill because yeah. and then I learned. Or, or I practiced rapping without cussing a whole lot. Now mm -hmm. I still do a couple, you know, for the emotion, you know, it's it's, a, it's an emotional thing. I get but it. But I could, I could just do raps without doing a whole lot of cussing. And that took me so much further. It made my rap stronger because I would have to figure out a whole lot of different ways to get the same effect and feel across and still make it sound hard because I like hard rap. I don't really yeah. like soft, yeah. like goofy <laughs> rap. Like I like conscious rap, but some of it be sounding goofy. And yeah. it's like, nah, I still like that gritty feel to it. And um, so I I learned how to kind of do what that and get that sound without doing a whole lot of cussing. And I think that's probably one of the most uh, strongest skill sets that I have. Yeah, I, I can tell. Yeah, I can tell in the tracks that I heard, man, from you, man. Respect. Very talented, very talented. Respect, thank you. Yeah, but that shredding of the book, man. Like, wait, how Bruh. thick was this book, though? Let me know. It was like, a comp. It was a composition book. Remember in the nineties, we had. I, I probably got one. No, I don't got one right here. But like them comp, you know them composition books that had the black and white design on the front. It was a whole composition book. Like I had it full. Like I used to write, 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 write. Mm -hmm. It's a whole joint, man. I had to shred the whole thing. Yeah, it just crushed my spirit. Crushed. Man. Me. So I know the importance of writing because, but the one thing I didn't do, I, I was a stand-up comic for like eight years, right? I never wrote anything down. I I had the thought in my head and I would just make the joke up in my head and I would practice it and practice it. Then I would go and I didn't even really do open mics. I would do that big show. So I'd actually try it oh, out at wow. a show. Yeah. Which is dangerous because you should really yeah. test your material. Right. You should work it out. <laughs> but tell me something. I want to know your thought on this, man. I know the importance of writing. And when I when I seen 8 Mile, I seen M with a notepad, like you're saying too, man. You have a notepad. Everyone has a notepad writing down their thoughts. So the importance of writing, do you get those thoughts in your head? So your rhyme schemes or whatever, and you write down and then you formulate songs letter, later? Or do you know that you want to think of lyrics for a, your next song and then you just sit and write or what do you think of guys like i don't know if jay was really that person but i heard biggs could just listen to a beat drink a juice go in the booth and spit off the top of his head because i heard juicy was off the top of his head mm -hmm. but what do you tell me your your thoughts around that about writing versus just kicking a freestyle and 
making a track just off the top. Yeah, I, I mean, I respect all of that. Um, my my personal preference is to write it because I'm, I'm very, very, very thoughtful about the message. Also, too, it's a form of journaling. Okay. It's 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 like a it's like for mental health reasons, like I'm, it's like journaling, like keeping a journal. So it's kind of like that, um, first and foremost. And then uh, and then kind of it turns into a song kind of as it comes out. But I'm just as comfortable kind of freestyling. But because I write with a lot of concepts, mm -hmm. it's important for me to write. Like yeah. if I'm just kicking a freestyle, I can go in the booth and do that too. I can go in the booth and it sound all right. Like I've kicked freestyles that just sound like a whole song, but mm -hmm. it, it doesn't really have a no concept. Mm -hmm. But when I, a lot of times when I write, I, I like concepts. I like having like a theme concepts and the consistency and being poignant about delivering the message. So for me, I like to write because mm -hmm. I'm doing things as I'm, as I'm rapping, like I'm setting up things, I'm setting, uh, you know, I'm setting up punchlines, I'm setting, setting up the storyline. So it's important for me to, to, to write it out. Um, and then also it's just kind of like a form of journaling. Cause I just be having, they're really just thoughts at this point in my life. It's just the way I think, like some people, like some of my close friends, they'll hear my, my songs and they'll, they'll be like, oh yeah, yeah we had a conversation. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's literally, yeah. Cause this is what I think. And yeah, you know, so Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm more, I'm more prone to writing if, you know, if I'm going to a studio and paying, I'm definitely going to have it kind of written out and I don't got it like that. Whereas I can just, you know what I mean? Just frivolously, frivolously, yeah. frivolously spend money in the studio and I can just be there for hours and stuff like that. When I got it like that, I'll go in there and freestyle more. Okay. Or like so if I'm do... at home, I could freestyle, I, you know, and, and get my setup here and, and just yeah. do rough drafts and then piece it together later. That's yes. cool. But it, it feels like it takes longer that way. So you do have set up at home for certain things, but you do have a studio that you pay for studio time to go yeah, in. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I like to. I like the professionals to kind of really do the the engineering. So stuff I might I might record rough drafts here, mm -hmm. or go to a buddy's house and do some rough drafts, and then I'll go to like the real studio to get the the touches, the real nice touches, and the the vocal effects, and you know, because the engineers they're the real MVPs. Quiet right. is kept. Yeah, know, shout out, know. shout out to the engineers, man. For real so yo tell me something now i want to get into the music for a minute so yeah. the first track i heard was unlost i can't lie my granddaddy was a rolling stone <laughs> yo so when i heard this the track was fire the production was amazing so i want to know because this reminded me when i seen the video i was so impressed because i don't watch things anymore like i used to mm -hmm. so when i get exposed to something like this i'm like wow this reminds me back in the day when you're waiting for your favorite artist to drop the video to their new song. And we had a station called Much Music. And now, whatever, I don't even know what Much Music plays now. It's like MTV in the right. States. Okay. Okay. Used to be about music. And then now it's reality TV oh. shows and all that, right? Mm. So we used to wait for the video to come out. That's what your video did to me. It excited me. And I'm known, oh, like, so if cool. something's good, I can't watch. I get up. I walk around. I shout. My wife thinks I'm crazy, right? When I see a crazy <laughs> dunk or I hear a lyric, I yeah. got to get up for a minute and then yeah. come back and finish it. Mm -hmm. So I finally finished it. And I'm like, wow, tell me the inspiration um, behind that. And I know I'm asking a lot here, but I want to know. You have a track called Major, yeah. right? And yeah. this is still supposed to be connected to Unlost. Yeah, so yeah. give me it all in one. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I'll start with Major. So Major is a song and it, it it's talking about like kind of like being anxious and it's like these thoughts I'm having to myself and I'm like talking to God, am I living my life right? Like, like what's going on? And, you know, when I talk to a lot of people, it's kind of like these are the things that they're they're wrestling with. So, you know, of course myself too, but I played it up. You know, yeah. I played it up real, real heavy. I even altered my voice a little bit. I, it was, I, I had to do that voice. That's not really my real voice. I yeah. had to do it like the whole song, you know. Uh, but, you know, it's like my demons, they argue with angels. My angels be sparking. I swear to some gangsters. And when people talk about, like, mental health, a lot of times, I believe it's like, it's like a spiritual health. So it's like your spirits are working in whatever ways and dealing with whatever's going on around you in the spiritual realm. So what you might think is like you're going crazy is you fighting your angels who are trying to fight for you against your demons, but you don't know who to fight. So that's what's causing the chaos within your mind. So Major was kind of like that. Um, 
and expressing that that kind of chaos in the mind. Then there's unlost, which is the the polar opposite. This is um, I, I wrote this actually last summer. I went to Nigeria. I had just got back, so I was feeling the energy of my people, of where I'm from, and I was feeling like a certain grounding. So then I just got the writing, like you know, what I, mean? I think I'm waking up for lost time, but not in this lifetime. I was told that I was supposed to write rhymes. My ancestors were superheroes. I'm supposed to fight, you know. So it's like I'm feeling that, like yo, yeah, man, I'm I'm supposed to be, I'm I'm, I'm you know, I'm still looking up, I ain't looking at my feet. Yeah, I can't be defeated. You know, I got the I got this energy around me and 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 people that could have, that have come before me. And so it's not like I'm found yet, but it's like I'm unlost, you know, because at least. Like being, they say, talk about people who are lost and walking around, and it's like, okay. And I don't think I'm like super found, but I know I'm unlost because at least I have a foundation of of what to go to, what to look at, where my people are from, and I had just came from there, so I was like, that's exactly how I was feeling, like unlost. I'm like, all right, like I'm, I got some grounding and some and, and some movement to go forward on, and that's really really important because you just people without it, if you don't have some sense of self it manifests itself into a lot of what we see in, 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 in the streets today, in the community today, mm -hmm. um, and not being attached to anything. So like even, so for me, like that's like really, really important. Like it or not, I don't, I'm not, you know, you got to take the good with the bad, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, so being of Nigerian descent or, or African descent, you know, a lot of people want to talk about Africa, like, yo, yeah, we were queens and kings. And it's like, nah, man, not everybody. It's like, it's only one king in the kingdom. What about the people who were farmers? What about the jewelers and the merchants and the businesswomen and the farmers? What about them? All that stuff is important. All of that stuff makes up a society. It's not, we can't all be kings and queens. And I get the value of that. I guess mm -hmm. when you're, when you've been depleted and brought down and you need some things to kind of build yourself back up, but I'd rather be hated for who I am than loved for who I'm not. So- mm -hmm. You know, you can't love, I, I can't love a people thinking that they're kings and queens and they're not. Like, I don't want to love the, that group of people. You know what I'm saying? And I don't want to be seen as that. Don't call me a king if, if one, you're not going to treat me like one. And two, if it, if the shoe don't fit, mm -hmm. love me for who I actually am. You know, I'm just, I'm just a son, man. You know what I mean? Like, don't, 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 don't attribute any extra like characteristics that don't belong to me. You know what I'm saying? I'm from I'm from West Africa. There is no there's no pyramids there. Like I don't want credit for building the pyramids. You know what I'm saying? I just want I want like I want credits for the for the culture and the arts that we have that we brought into the world. That that's what that's what people came there for is the arts and the culture. And I'm trying to represent and I hate saying the culture because it's been so bastardized. Mm -hmm. But when I'm talking about the culture, like I'm from the part of Nigeria I'm from is is Edo State. And so we're known for making those masks. So I don't know if you, you've seen um, the Black Panther movie. Yeah. So I don't know if you remember in the first one where Killmonger was in the museum mm -hmm. and there was that fuzzy, furry, crazy mask. But okay. then right next to him, it was this other, it was this other African mask. Now that mask is notorious. They use it all over the world. But the UK, the British, they literally came to my state where I'm from, mm -hmm. robbed and pillaged and stole that mask, like that exact mask from my people. And they, they show it all over the world now. That is the, the culture that, that made that mask is where I'm from. I, I can celebrate that. The pyramids, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's a whole nother part of Africa, right? Those are, to me, those are Arabs. And like, I don't, I, we don't got that much in common. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So I'd rather be, you know, um, hated for who I am than love for who I'm not. So that's kind of putting, I put that into that kind of as well too, to, to, to make us kind of like think about that a little bit more. Like that's why I'm in the joint. I'm in the joint with my monk robe, the unlawful, right? I'm in the joint with the monk robe, yeah. bare feet standing in the woods. Mm -hmm. That's where I come from. I love it, man. Go, you're dropping knowledge on this. Um, <laughs> and, and more on the, on the actual production. How long did that take to shoot, man? Like it was so well produced, bro. I, hey, I love it. Shout out V, man. Shout out to Sister V, man. V Visuals by V. Man, dude, that was like a guerrilla video shoot. We mm -hmm. did actually, so we shot the video for Major and Unlost in the same day. What? In like in like a few hours. Yeah. We 
we really got there. It was like a, she was running a special where she would do guerrilla video shoots. But I was like, all right, boom, I'm gonna get. She, and she had a she had a really good price at the time, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, yo, I'm gonna get my money's worth. Mm-hmm. I had to, I had a little bit of a concept for major, but we found the location. Like we we kind of I had a rough idea, but we were just scouting. Like, oh no, nah, this is better. We found the train yard, and like so we did all that, and then. For Unlost, I had the location, I had the woods because, you know, there's yeah. woods and and I knew where to go and kind of like, I, you know, I had the little props and everything. I mean, we shot that very gorilla, but the way she cut it together, she had, she added her own vision to it. It looked like, I was like, yo, you, you, like, you wouldn't even <laughs> think it was, was just shot like that. We really shot that in like a couple of hours, if that really, um, so shout out to her for having the vision, but obviously, you know, I, I came with a lot of the ideas already. Yeah. You know, I, I had the I had the wardrobe. I had the you know, I dyed my hair gray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and everything <laughs> looked like old man. So um, yeah, we we really shot that in a couple of hours, and then she went to work, and I could tell that, you know, she really had fun doing it. So I, you know, shout out shout out Fee. Yeah, visuals by Fee. I'm amazing, man. I, I yeah, I didn't know. I'm glad you shouted her out, man, because I was so impressed with it. Just everything, the lyrics went with the visuals. It seems like when people have that certain skill. Like some people say I have it when I do some editing, right? But I'm junior, man. But when I see certain things, I'm like, people really have the vision. And it, you know what's important? When they see your vision, what you want, they can right. understand what fits for that. Right. You know and, I mean? yeah, and yeah, she really, really did. Took it to the, because I, I promise you, after we shot the video, mm-hmm. I didn't say nothing. When she cut it all up, I didn't yeah. give her any type of like direction. Direction? She just, yeah. yeah, nah. She was listening to the lyrics, obviously. And I'm sure I'm not, I mean, not to sound, you know, not to sound overzealous, but I mean, I can imagine she shoots a lot of, I, you know, I've seen her work. She does great work, but she shoots a lot of rap videos. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, what are most rap songs are about, you know, trapping and, you know. Yeah. And, 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 so like, then there's this. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure that like it gave her some more room for that artistic expression and artistic creativity. And yeah, and and she just had it up. And I was I was just like, I was really pleased with how it came out. So yeah. yeah. Shout out to you once again. Nice. Yo, you mentioned trap. Like I'm so out of touch right now. You like if I were to bump music in my car, it would be everything from the eighties and nineties, early two thousands, right? I don't right. really venture out into new things that much. But tell me something, man. I asked this question. We used to have debates, some of my friends, because we thought that that rap and hip hop lost its way. Like, you know what I mean? When it, it to me, it kind of went downhill. But I, I talked to some people that are still in the game and then they're saying, you know, it's a progression, you know, the music's going to evolve. But I personally didn't like what it evolved to when we talk about where it came from. And when I grew up, you did have, you know, we used to make fun of people like MC Hammer. You know what I mean? Yeah, so you had your your hip hop, then you had your Fresh Prince, yeah, uh, yeah, Will yeah, Smith, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still a lyricist. Some people even put put LL in that too, but LL to me is he's raw. He's, he's yeah, good. he was kind of hard though. Yeah, 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 yeah but yeah, they yeah. put him in that category when you compare yeah. him to like NWA and different right. things like that. But then I I felt like it lost its way, even though we have. Kendrick Lamar and J. Cole, and there's probably many rappers that I don't know now. But what's your take, man? Because I'm sure you know your history now. So you got into it, right? In yeah. the, the 90s, you said. But um, what do you think, going back to 80s till what it is today? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. And that's a, like an endless, timeless debate. You know, mm-hmm. um, I feel like I don't think hip hop has lost its way as much as the people have and the culture has right it's not like rappers only make music that they know people are going to listen to Mm -hmm. so if the standard was you have to make thought-provoking songs all the artists would get in line to do it that's just not the standard Mm -hmm. the the so you know the young artists they're just making what what young people like and and people always use the excuse that like oh the radio and the media and they control well that's not the case in 2022 it's just not so that 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 excuse worked in 1995 Mm -hmm. but even still in 1995 you still had all the ratchet music however you had variety 
And I think hip hop should have variety. Like all 10 songs that they play in the last hour on the radio shouldn't sound the same. Right. There should be, yeah, there's your there's your DMXs and your Camerons and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. your, you know, and your 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 three six mafia and all that stuff. Okay. But then there's like, you know, your Fuji's and, and and things like that and your commons and stuff like that. And then everything in between. That's how I believe hip hop should be. Mm -hmm. And then different people can get in where they fit in and find their lane. However, you know, there is just is just kind of one type of music that's really, really marketable and profitable, right? So you pushed, yeah. Yeah. And, and and well, yeah, and yeah, we're the ones pushing it. It's our DJs that are pushing it. It's just when the artists, when when artists get into the studio for a while, you know, rappers was like, yo, I can can I want to make a song that that bangs in the strip club. Mm -hmm. So it's like the the strippers want the music. Right. It's not the media. It's not the the record companies. It's what the strippers want to dance to. But that's what yeah. that's what you cater into. Like all this like conspiracy stuff. I get it, but like it, we gotta really take accountability mm -hmm. for what we want in our culture. If we weren't so driven by the strip club, it then the, we would make different music. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and and so and that music though, the good quality music, it's out there. We just don't want to listen to it that much. It's yeah. like even. Even with the uh, member, the, um, you probably don't remember. You probably don't watch this garbage. But like with the reality, with the reality TV shows, right? There's always the the fighting and the women that are angry and they're hating at each other, right? Mm -hmm. But then when um, I think Tia and, and Tamara, I know Maori, the, the twins, when they had their joint, women weren't watching it. Yeah, that's not what's so. It's like. Who's to blame for that? You can't really blame like the the TV producers because they just doing what y'all want. If y'all was like, if people was like, no, we don't want this garbage music, mm -hmm. they can't make money off of it, and therefore they wouldn't sell it. They're it. just trying to make money, so they're gonna do whatever you like. Yeah. You know, the consumers have, especially in 2022, the consumers have all the power. Yeah. We've made so many artists blow up without record deals. We, that's not a hindrance anymore. We can't say, oh, it's the media, the record labels. They all need the, we can't really say that anymore because how many artists have we seen blow up without record deals? Yeah. So I think we as a people got to take more responsibility for whatever's driving. If hip hop is trash, then it's because we're trash. I get it. You yeah. Know what I mean? Well said. Uh, that's a good take on it, man. A right, good take. Yeah, word up. And, and now you're talking about social media. You you came in an era. Did you come in the social media era? Because I remember when Facebook came about. I was telling my my last guest or something that um I remember when I got my first Facebook account. This is like it was MySpace. Yeah, and right. then um I, I, Facebook. I that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then. People didn't really use it for like business and and marketing. Wow. It's like oh, get in touch it with old friends that. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't for that. Yeah, yeah. But how have you used social media now? Because I like some of your pokes, man. So do you know how to use it to your advantage now that Instagram is here? And I don't know if you're on Twitter, but YouTube and things like that. Yeah. Or nah, are you I'm, just getting into it? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm struggling to use it as a business tool i was yeah. good at using it as a social tool like when instagram first dropped like so yeah i'm in the facebook generation right um, yeah, okay when when mark zuckerberg first dropped the joint like i was in college so remember it was on first it was only for college yeah. students and then it was high school and then they opened it up to everybody so like i was in that first wave um of, of facebook so yeah it was social but i used to use it to promote my shows and really that's the only reason i kept it i hated social media actually yeah i really never really liked it mm -hmm. but i was i was in college i was performing a lot so i had to keep it because we were going to all the different colleges and stuff like that so i had to keep it for that and i used it for that um uh but i'm still kind of learning it and working it and now there's the algorithm and you you got to <laughs> pay for ads and like figure out like i'm 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 still learning it um i i struggle with with social media cuz i i like i just like keeping being to myself yeah so i'm learning how to like be on it a little bit more and 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 be a little bit more um out there so it it takes a lot of work um i'm still working it and learning yeah. the marketing aspects of it um so now i'm just trying to put it all into play yeah you're, you're a performer though right you you like you like that performance um yeah. i want to touch on that a little bit later but the second track i want to talk about is is soul fly because again lyrics 
anything I listen to by you, I know it's going to be dope. So the lyrics are nice. But the one thing I want to ask about So Fly, though, is I seen you shot it. It looks like you shot it in your in, yeah. your, in your house. Yeah. Right? In the crib, yeah. In the crib, right? So the only thing I want to ask about that was a lot of us who are in these kind of industries, we because you did have someone to produce on Lost and uh, yeah, Major. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. you know how we put our effort into these things. So I do the podcast and I'm doing the editing and yep. the teasers and all that. So when you did So Fly, you did the editing using yep. certain software and stuff, and yep. Yourself, yep. right? Yeah, I did all that. Yeah, mm-hmm. my son, my son helped me shoot it. You know what I mean? And, oh, okay. um, yeah, I, made him, I made him shoot the drink for me. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, and then I, I just did it by myself. Um, was that during the pandemic? I don't know. I can't remember. It might have been. Nah, maybe not. I don't know. But around it, not too long, you know, after the uh, things were crazy. So, I mean, I was just home. Yeah, you know what I mean. So it's like, yeah, let me just let me just shoot it here in the crib. And I wanted a video for the song, and I didn't want to let anything stop me. Um, so yeah, and I've got a lot of those those kind of those skills, like with video editing, music editing. A lot of them kind of like they kind of go together. You know, cutting audio is like cutting video, and you got to line things up and adjust the volume in the game yeah. and all that stuff. And um, but the video joint, the video is a whole another beast. I mean, I'm. A novice, you know, I feel like a novice, but I can get I can get a product out. Yeah. You know, I yeah. Out. Nice. Yeah, I know. I, I like that skill. I like editing videos, man. I really like, do. It, you enjoy it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. If you if if you have a if you're okay with the meticulous nature of it, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like if you you know, it's not for everybody because it's like it be it can be really, really meticulous. But I like that. I like making things fit timing and stuff like that i really like that stuff so yeah yeah, yeah shout yeah. out to all the video editors <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> okay the last track i want to ask you about man is um reaching father Ooh. so you got to tell me man so it seems like um that track was the importance of fathers but more importantly black fathers yeah. so i feel you had a message can you okay. share that with uh, the listeners and the watchers, man. Man, how much time we got? <laughs> no, so, so I, I, you know, so I'm a father of three, um, and I have three beautiful children, and I had it with with three different women, mm-hmm. which is, it sounds like heart wrenching. It's like very cringy, like. Ugh. However, I I haven't really had a rough experience as one might think. Like mm-hmm. I did, I've had very little relatively little baby mama drama and, and, and things like that um things ain't been perfect but compared to what i'd be seeing dudes go through and they just be having one and it just it hurts man it i'm not gonna lie like it hurts because i feel like some of these guys would probably be better fathers than me had they been given the chance so that's kind of where reaching father was good you know i mean that that, that was the message that's where it kind of came from and you know it's appreciation of like my own self as a father but also the challenge too because when you're raising kids in a society that believes that fathers are trash is it is going to conflict even if you are a good father Mm -hmm. so it's like you know you know you should know a black dad ain't a bad dad you know because that's the first thing people will say i remember when my children were young and i first had them you know i'd be out with them or whatever and (coughs) you know people would be like oh wow that's so cute you know y'all you're spending time with your children and like it was cool at first you know the ladies was checking me out and you know what I mean I thought it was cool at first but after a while it was kind of like why y'all so surprised like this is what I'm supposed to be doing like this ain't you know it's just and it really I really started to see this this the effect and then just as seeing other men and hearing the stuff that they got to go through to see their kids and what really broke me I think what really inspired that song was one time Nah, I can't pick one event, but I'll share this one event where there was a young dude who I knew, um, a younger dude, and he was like, yeah, what's up, man? You know, let's go hang out. And I was like, all right, yeah, that, yeah we maybe do that stuff. But I said, I'm not sure because I might I might be spending time with my, my children this weekend. And he kind of got really mad. It wasn't at me, mm-hmm. but it was at in general, he was just like, man, why y'all always say that? What do you mean you might spend time with your children? Like, why do all of y'all be saying that? Like, how do you not know? 
And he wasn't mad at me, but he was, the frustration was coming at me. And like, I feel him like, it's scary. Like you hear all these dude with children talking about, they might see their children or everything is pending based on whatever happens this weekend. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was, it's, it is madness, but like, to me, it was a norm. And it, and him pointing that out, it's just, it's like, yeah, that is crazy. You know? Yeah. So it was like, I had to put that in the, in, you know, so, you know, if you're keeping a child from a dad, then F you, you know, every man deserves the right to raise the seed, whether or not you like his former deeds, what he's supposed to be, Mr. Clean, Mr. Green, Mr. Everything that yours wasn't, <clears throat> you know, so it's like some of these expectations are just like unrealistic and just let a man be a man, mm -hmm. excuse me. So, yeah, like. My oldest child's uh, mother, who's the GOAT, <clears throat> mm -hmm. she says, you know, if you let a man, she says way better than I can say it, but she pretty much says, if you let a man do what he's supposed to do as a father on his own terms, he'll step up to the plate. Mm -hmm. And she gave me that grace when I was a young, dusty ass, 22 year old, <clears throat> trying to figure it out. She, she really was patient with me and she let me work it out. So. I was able to become, you know, the father that I am to my children today. And so that's important, you know, allowing um, men to kind of do what they're supposed to do and not trying to control them or restrict them or a lot of times, you know, the state has to be involved because we're so childlike, we're so we're such children and we have to let the state come in and tell us how to handle the affairs of our children. Mm -hmm. Now, some dads just are trash. Fine. But I would I would argue that there is probably more than we like to think that really want to be in their children's lives. Because mm -hmm. even scum of the earth revel in the idea of having a seed, yeah. you know, to reproduce whatever scum they do on the earth. So, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't know what we can do about that, but those are just my words. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, I'm I'm thanks for sharing that. And um I can really hear that message come through, ring through in the lyrics. If anybody wants to listen to that, it's called Reaching Father. Um, beautiful yep. track, man. Beautiful track. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So we come to the point in the interview. I have a question that you're going to answer. But first, what's the end goal for you? Or what's, what's the plateau that you're at right now where you want to go up even more? What are you doing right now? Um... Yeah, as far as music, so on the audio kind of side, because I produce as well, um, I really want to get more into scoring um, mm -hmm. and um, kind of like films and video games and things like that. So I've worked on, um, a buddy of mine worked on his film. He, he produced, he dropped it. Well, he had the film screening back in October. Mm -hmm. Um, and I uh, got to work with that during the pandemic. I got to, I got my first IMDb credits uh, for, oh, a film, <laughs> for a yeah. film, uh, that I worked on with another buddy of mine. So really on the, on the audio production side, I mean, I really want to get into more of like, um, producing, I really want to get a video game credit because I yeah. make some, like some of these crazy, like exciting beats that like go well with like a race car game or action game. So, um, I'm working on that. And then um, musically, like rap, as far as lyrics and, and things like that, um, mm -hmm. I'm looking to work collaboratively with more artists, but just just get this idea, just raise the bar. I really just yeah. want to, really all I really want to do is raise the bar. Honestly, like if I, it, I wouldn't even rap if there was like, a, if I felt like there was enough like thought provoking music mm -hmm. uh, that didn't, that, you know, that sounded like listenable to me, I yeah. probably wouldn't even rap, but you know, when they say, you know, if, if you see a, a, a need, then just, just fill it, fulfill it. it. So I'm just going to continue to just uh, continue to just make like thought provoking. You can call, I guess you can call it conscious. I don't really, I don't, but I guess you can call it conscious, you know, um, because uh, it just thought provoking conscious music. Um, that sounds good. That's something that you could listen to, that you can bump and it feels cool. Yeah, you know, without yeah. you don't got to necessarily hide it from your kids or hide it from, from yeah. anybody. It's like, <laughs> yo, nah, this joint dump, this joint bump. So yeah. I still want. I'm gonna I'm continue to kind of do that, and that's kind of what I'm shooting for. Okay, nice. Um, before I ask the question too, you do you work because I seen one of your posts where you're doing. 
actually a live performance with a band. So that was kind of cool. So tell me about that. And then how do you handle, because that might be at night and you, you have a day job. Let me know about that. Yeah, no, I got a day job. I still got a day job, you know, um, but after, uh, you know, after this video and like, you know, all your fans start supporting, hopefully that could change. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah. right now, yeah, no, I, I got a day job um, and I was working with, so that band was part of a arts collective here in DC um, called uh, the District Collective. And so they were actually doing a show and they, like they, they already had the band and everything set up. But uh, my man, Mike just called me. He heard, he seen me perform at another event and he was like, he was like, oh, yeah, man, like, yo, come and do a couple songs. Like, we got the band. And literally, I came to the show that day. They heard the song a couple of times. They just did their rendition, like, yeah. live. And we did, that was, like, the first time we did that together. Oh God. I know. They were they're a phenomenal band and um, they were able to help recreate the sound. And then, you know, I just did my thing with the performance, but it ain't nothing like performing with a live band. So I really want to get back more into live performances. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, the pandemic kind of like set me, set me, set, set me uh, into my introverted ways. Right. Cause I, you know, you gotta be extroverted yeah. to, to do performing. Of so course. I realized I'm an ambivert. I'm not, I'm not like an extrovert, like I'm an ambivert. So like I can do extroverted things, but I really like being to myself. So wow. yeah, so the pandemic really brought that out of me. And I just really got into like this whole, oh, I'm gonna just keep to myself because I really like to do that. So now I'm trying to get back in there and back into the swing and get out there and, and be more social again. Wow, you remind me of myself, but I haven't heard that term before. Oh yeah, I just learned it myself. Not so ambivert, you said. <laughs> yeah, it's a real thing. Yeah, ambivert. Yeah, because you know what we used to say, even when I took psychology, they they would say I'm an introverted extrovert. They would just use the terms, right? Okay, but amber, yeah. because what you described as me, I right. I don't I don't like. Well, back in the days, you know, you go up with your friends, you go to the clubs, and but I'm more into what I am now internally my soul i like just being with my family yeah i don't like going out i don't like crowds too much right but some people are like oh you do this this is not the same thing <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah okay. yeah people, people are like people never believe me i'd be like no i really like to keep my nobody would believe me even people who know me for years they'd be like what are you talking about like you're always yeah. like you're all and i am like if i go somewhere like i'm live now i'll say hi to people and I'm like but like if i if i get to just chill at home in a calm environment that's even better yeah i'm just as comfortable you know so it's yes yeah, but it's called the ambivert yeah and I, I learned that recently i was like oh yeah that's that described me perfectly yeah so hey, um, thanks for teaching me that one boy <laughs> yeah. but yo you see i'm gonna ask this question but you just keep me i just the covid man covid how did mm -hmm. that affect you then man like i really liked i started working from home my job and then I got to spend time with my dog, um, and she passed away. So I got oh, a I good two that. years. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, on your other show, you were talking about that. Yeah, you but know I got what's a funny? Good... Mm -hmm. I, and I know you about to ask a question, but I got a I got a buddy of mine, a really good buddy of mine. He's into music. His name is Arvin as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I was watching her episode. And I was you like, saw oh, Arvin? Man. Yeah, the tabla. Yeah. 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 Yeah, man. But COVID really. It helped me think think like I, I wanted to think. I it opened my mind to a lot of things. And I got to spend time with the family, the dog, as I was saying. And I got to spend um, time with myself. And, what, and that's how I started the podcast. Because I was like thinking, like, what I want to do. And then two, almost two years later, you know, I'm, I'm on, a, on a track with this stuff. But how did it affect you with this COVID? Yeah, that's a good, I didn't even really have time to even feel affected, man. I was, uh, you know, kids were home and they're trying to do homeschool, oh. work from home, yeah, mm -hmm. work from home, school from home, um, taking care of everything. Um, I, it, it just, I just had to like, yeah, I had to kind of pivot and really kind of get into the reality of like, I'm gonna have to get good with social media. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Like I, it, it, that really uh, settled in. Um, I wanted to, I was going on a lot of podcasts actually, cause you know, everyone was starting podcasts. So like, yeah. 
I was like getting, I was like being on like all of my friends' podcasts and stuff like that. So yeah, it eventually mm -hmm. made me want to want to start that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, actually, so and then I'm gonna actually continue. Hopefully, I must continue back with my uh, Reaching Father podcast because I actually made that a podcast. You did. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I, I did a, I did a season. And I got to vamp it back up. Yeah. Um, but that was really, really important. Like talking about like fatherhood and 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 the importance of just better men. You know, because mm -hmm. we have fathers everywhere. I don't know this whole lack of a father. I don't. I don't. I miss that. Yeah. You know, I live. I live in the hood. To be fathers uh, everywhere I see. Yeah. But it's more like maybe we need like we need better men that's kind of like my message and you know, because I, again like you were saying during the pandemic it was like thinking things through it was like do we really need more fathers in the community because i like i'm pretty sure that like at least 95 percent of these children born have fathers like i don't know how else they got here yeah so true what what needs to be better um mm -hmm. or what needs to be improved it's it, it's so you know um thinking thinking that through i think that the pandemic gave me the courage to kind of like say some of these things out loud mm -hmm. Yo, again before i ask this um where where can i listen to your podcast then like oh um at, at reaching father reaching uh you, it's on instagram at reaching father podcast um reaching father podcast.com yo send, um, send me the link yeah, after right the link. it's yeah, sweet yeah, man yeah, and you know i'm gonna i'm gonna cop that track i gotta get that track man um i like to support people man i interviewed um amazing artist wavy spice one mm -hmm. and um i got her track off uh apple mm -hmm. and i enjoyed it and i'm gonna support you bro so i appreciate it mm -hmm. yeah thank you man i really appreciate it yeah man okay by my hands which card do you want me to read out the right or the left um i'm gonna go with the right Oh, wow. Okay. This one hardly comes up. Name one challenging thing you had to overcome in life. Oh, just one. Um, okay. <laughs> one challenging thing you had to overcome. Man, that's difficult because it's like, I don't know if you ever overcome them. They are continuously challenging. Like many of the things in my life that are like they're continuously challenging. Like you, I don't know if you ever, if I ever overcome it, but I would say, um, balancing like like being a father, right? Um, and balancing that, right? Obviously, I'm not done, so it's not like I've overcame and like it's done and I'm not a father. Anymore. But it's a continuous challenge that I appreciate. Um, being a father working out the nuances of a whole nother person and coming to the terms that oh he, here's the the challenge in and of itself the challenge okay that i've had to overcome and make it really specific is in being a father the challenge of realizing or believing or understanding that these are not my children i'm just their guardian and that's a, that was a challenge for me because you know, it's like, oh, my children, I'm going to have them do this way. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make them do that. Ah, me, 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 me. And it just becomes about me because I think that they're my children. But I realized that, like, man, they came here with their own purpose, their own destiny, their own thing, and their own soul. That ain't mine. So I've had to humble myself and realize, okay, well, I'm their guardian. So I'm not going to be disappointed or have these unrealistic expectations and just i'm going to allow that soul to be nurtured in the best way that i can do it so i think that was a really difficult challenge for me because i had all these preconceived notions at first and so i think overcoming that has has been one of the most difficult things for me to do and you know i'm, I'm glad that i'm mostly over it mm. wow oh, man i i hear new things all the time man thanks for sharing that with me Okay, so the last thing I do on Real Talk is um, I donate to a charity after every episode. And I oh, forgot yeah. to ask you to think of one that I'll be donating to for episode 10. Oh, yeah. No, you told me. I just forgot. I to did tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Um... Oh, yes. All right. So, yeah, the charity that I think that you should donate to is the Core Health Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, it's not a charity as much as it is a nonprofit organization, mm -hmm. but I think it's a really dope organization in Baltimore, Maryland that works with um, a lot of youth 
teaching them skills in business and entrepreneurship, as well as martial arts. So yeah, if you, um, shoot, if you, anybody's listening the Core Hill Health Institute in Baltimore, if you want to send some funds that way, go ahead and do the thing. Right. That's where I'll be donating to. Send me the, send me the, the link or information sure. after so I can sure. do that. Absolutely. All right. Yo, do you have any words of inspiration before we go to anyone? Because I like asking this question. Um, anyone that's ready to give up on their dream? Because I'm sure you went through this. You know, there's a struggle that we go through in our minds. Um, you know, we have to support family. We got to support ourselves. But we, not all of us, but some of us have this dream to do something beyond the nine to five and things like that. And because of that struggle with, I got to make money. Sometimes you just give up on your dream when you might be on a good path. Do you have any words of wisdom for someone to keep them on that path? I would say, yeah, don't forget the why. Um, the why of what, what it is that you want. And, you know, what what would your life be like without it? You know, and does it have to look like a certain way? It may not. It may not have to look like a certain way. You can still you know, pursue your dream and pursue your passion. It may not look a certain way, but it, it may if you stick with it. So, you know, continue just to, to believe in why you enjoy doing the thing and what value it brings to your life. And hopefully that, that'll keep you going because that's that's what keeps me going. So. Thank you. All right. Osa the Healer. Um, Let me know first, where, where did the name come from? Let me know the healer. How did you come up with that? Oh man, it's actually really, really shallow. It's not even that deep. Um, okay, <laughs> I actually, it's actually. I matter of fact, it, it actually started on MySpace. <laughs> oh really? So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, a friend of mine, she used to crochet, uh, like hats and scarves, mm. and I was where I had like scarf and kind of I had it draped over like a shawl and like I had a hat. She just took a picture of me and I had like this pose. It was like this or something. Yeah. And I was just like, oh man, I look like a healer or something. Like that was it. And like I just posted it on my MySpace and then it, it just it was also the healer. Um it may have been prophetic. You know what I'm saying? It may have been prophetic at the time. It wasn't that deep at the time. It may have been prophetic. And um I feel as though I've always used music to kind of heal myself. You mm -hmm. know, I I don't claim to be like no healer of other people. I'm not doing no Reiki on nobody. I ain't can't I can't really <laughs> I got my own, you know what I mean? I'm not there yet. Yeah. However, that may be that may be the case one day. Um, but music is has been a source of healing for me. And I've seen that how it how we in general people use music for all the moods of their life when they're happy, when they're sad, you know, mm -hmm. when they're going through something. And so that mood that music creates. Um, is is healing and for me you know the music that I create for myself where I'm releasing my thoughts it's like yeah I'm the healer of myself so, sweet all right yeah. thanks sweet. for sharing that yes all right also the healer thanks for coming out today salute this yeah, is real tough oh yes definitely real tough with Sash Scorpio season 5 episode 10 and we out peace